know, the business course, we all have to kind of have a link. I don't link really my password there. <laughs> Seriously? No. All right, we're live now. Okay. Um, I've got the questions up. If you're a crew member at Pizza Pie in Rexburg, right? That would be me. Okay. Um, so the Jim Sharp case is the first one. <clears throat> what did you guys think of this case first off? I didn't like it. Why are you laughing with me? Because I, I just, I just think, uh, yeah, it's not bad. I don't know. I just don't know why you didn't like it so strongly. I thought there's been worse cases. Oh, okay. There's worse cases. I think, I don't know. This one was hard for me to, I guess, follow more I don't know maybe it's just me I'm a special case I guess yeah I've, I agree with Lindsay I've seen worse that's true um, but I, I don't know I mean I'm trying to be you know positive about the whole case study thing I'd really and it's great to get everyone's thoughts and have these group meetings and stuff but I'd love to have like a lecture led class too I agree. I'm you know, with about these, like it just feels like here's the problem, Blah. and then it would be kind of nice to know like what actually really happened, you know, to see if because we're just throwing some ideas out there, and I don't know if they're right. We're like, okay, great, all right, next question, let's move on, and that's really all that's expected, and then we'll write some stuff on it. But um, anyway, it, I think it'd be good to have some historical context of of what actually happened after this point in the real world. And then, yeah. and then look at that and discuss that. Because I think that's what they did. And like I watched a Harvard, um, like it was a video about the Harvard case studies and stuff like that. And so that's, that's kind of what they did. But, you know. but life's good. I'm learning a lot from these, being positive, all that fun stuff. <laughs> they were, so the first question for this one is, assess this venture um, from Jim Sharp's perspective. Um, did you just get that little bing from Jorge? No. Uh, yes, but I'm trying to pull it up. He okay. left the group chat, and that's what I got. He's saying... Oh, yeah. I see it. He's having problem here, problems hearing us. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll keep him updated. I okay. think he can back. Um, I think, I think the, what was the question? <laughs> Um, assess the, the, or this venture from Jim Sharp's perspective. I think it's a good investment. You know, it seems like it could be successful and it just doesn't have the right management and operating tools. You know, he said there was a lot of material, you know, like left in the warehouse or not being used or whatever. And maybe this better facility management and could be, I think it could turn around and be pretty successful. Yeah, I, I agree too. Um, so like on page like four, one of the things that I liked is he was talking about um, profit improvements, but it's, um, let's see, he says, I learned instead that profit improvements come from good solid cost reductions. So I've been in sales my professional my whole professional career and I'm just like people are always wanting better prices and I'm like, oh my gosh, stop it, you know, for twenty five cents or for whatever. And uh and now uh, I think it was a different class that I took and it, it was this Excel spreadsheet that kind of showed, you know, hey look, if you reduce costs by two percent, that you know, you would have to grow sales by twenty percent. Obviously there's a bunch of um variables in, in this equation. But it really kind of made sense to me that to improve profitability, there's a lot of things that you can do, but looking at cost reduction has huge benefits. Because my mind has always just been sell more, sell more, grow, but there's there's other ways to it. So yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for him. He, he has good big business background, but yeah, sorry, that's my thoughts. 
No, I, I, I agree with that. I think, I think in any business, really, especially with new investors, new owners, anything that there's brought in new, there's more focus on, on, like you said, the selling, 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 but they don't realize that in order to be profitable, their investments, their R and D material costs, everything else has to be lower in order to get that. Yeah, definitely. Yep. I mean, it just, it just seems like his background, just like he was made to, to go into this type of business and really look at it, analyze it, and look at all these different ways that he could grow things and make things better. Yeah, it seemed like he had a knack for it all. It, he really, it, and what's funny is I think he said, um, it is, it's within the first little bit, but he says like he never expected um, he never thought about, he, he never expected his life to go that route, especially his business profession. Yeah, I feel like that stuff happens, you know, naturally. As you're kind of directed in the stuff you're real good at and you, you're excelling in. Yeah. Totally. Um, sorry, I was adding something. Um, so how did Jim Sharp purchase this fin venture and what are the implications of this financial structure? I think uh, you go. Uh, no, go. Uh, no, I was just, I, I don't know if this is the, the part, but I like kind of reading through there here and trying to find the exact you know, because they're, they're, they're asking these questions from specific paragraphs and stuff, but um, I liked what he did. He said, I proceeded to draw a 50 mile circle, circle around my home. So he's looking at a radius, 10 months, uh, he, there are 60 uh, companies. He made offers on 12, raised financing on three and successfully completed the transaction on one. And he, you know, he wanted to keep 100% ownership too. Anyway. But, but that doesn't answer the question. How did he, I'm trying to find where that is. I don't remember reading that. Did he say that, I mean, oh, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, no, you go. It, it, it talked about how, like you said, he, he spent the time and effort to look for, and it wasn't even necessarily what he wanted, but something that met certain criteria. Um, and because of that, he learned, okay, well, I have to do this, this, and this, or this quicker, this slower, um, this more analytically, this more literally. So he had to adapt um, as he learned and as he, as he moved forward. Yeah, and in that Excel spreadsheet that was attached to the um, first part, of questions like the in the prep you know it gave the I think it said like he agreed to purchase the business for two million he financed a hundred thousand in equity you know from his savings had a seven hundred thousand dollars seller note a four hundred five hundred forty thousand six-year non-compete a term loan of five hundred and ten thousand and a revolving line of credit of a hundred and nine thousand from the bank so he has it quite split up. Wow. But he has 100% ownership? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't see that spreadsheet, which is maybe why I didn't know what that answer was. Awesome. <laughs> um, so Jorge sent me an email really quick. He says that um, uh, he says that he considers that he based the venture and everything on the financial statements that he had. So like you're saying on the spreadsheet that was attached, um, and by calculating value, he decided if it was worth the investment or not. Or 
overhead can you give us? I don't think but he can either. He can communicate. I can hear I can just some words. Yeah, I just, um, I'm uh, having uh, hard uh, times uh, as well just listening. Just your words. Hmm. So two people with bad internet. Yeah, I took my video off in case that was bogging him down, but I don't oh. maybe that didn't happen. I can try. Can can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can I can hear, hear, you, hear you, Hector. Hector. Okay, cool. Yep. So Hector, just so you know, um, we're talking about the Jim Sharp case right now. Okay. Um, oh, that's the wrong spot. So the next question was, what should or what should Jim Sharp do on his first day as owner <coughs> of Extrusion Technology Incorporated? Has anyone else ever watched The Prophet with Marcus Lemonis? No. No. Oh. Okay. Is it is the is it is it that show where? He goes to company uh, to little businesses and redo them. Yep, that that's exactly it. So he'll go in, he'll invest in these companies. Um, and I know it's not this case, but you know, one of the things is he goes in and kind of announces, like, "Hey, I, you know, I've invested X amount. I have this percentage of the business, and I'm a hundred percent in charge." And he kind of just, you know, so he introduces himself, and, and I guess. <laughs> You know, you need to make sure, you know, any time a bus business changes ownership, changes hands, really want to make sure that, that the employees stay on board and they don't just start jumping ship and say like, well, I don't work here, don't get anything to show for it. They want to know that you're stepping in and you're going to lead them. So you need to kind of share a vision for where, you know, you know kind of just say, here's where the company's at, here's where I think we can go. And let's do it together. So that's what I think. So it kind of gives us a vision or his overall idea yeah. for the company and what he wants. I think the internet is better since we all put our videos off. Yeah, I think it does. I think so. Um, Jorge put, he's emailing me the questions as we go. Okay. First day, you should meet with the executive team, figure out where they're at, and kind of come to an agreement as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's smart just to get things settled right from the beginning and get everyone on the same page. And then would it be smart to do that and then to move with your vision directly? Was you that way? Can you say that one more time? So Jorge's idea is that, you know, Jim Sharp the first day comes in, talks to all the managers, the leaders, um, everybody and figures out where they're, where the company's at and things like that from their perspective as well. Um, and then my question was, if you began that way, would that be the smarter decision? Because then you could move as a group instead of, you know, you being the boss or Jim saying like, hey, I want it done this way, you need to do it this way. Or does it help ease it in slowly um, and build that trust that they need? I think that's a good I think that's a good uh, technique or strategy because then you're helping the team the, the key people in the business you know maybe some of the production managers and different you know billing the billing manager I don't know that maybe the purchasing manager um, you're kind of getting their their buy-in like you said you're not Jim isn't just coming in and saying all right here's how it's done you know, that they feel like they're 
like the new guy on the block listens. I mean, he's got to lead him. He's got to make the final decision, and they have to know that. But I yeah. think that's, I think that is a, a good example of servant leadership. You know, where you're you're actually looking to the people that are doing things every day. Uh, but you still have to give them direction, right? So if there if there's a bunch of things that are not efficient, obviously either there's not enough oversight or the people that are in these managerial <clears throat> positions, they don't have the skill set needed to, to run things as lean and as uh, efficient as, as it can be. Uh, so, I mean, in some cases, you're going to have to make some, some – uh, choices and changes uh, as to who is where, or maybe letting some people go. But you know, you don't. You definitely don't want to come in on the first day and just like fire half the people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I like all those points you just said about being a good leader and you know get everyone on the same page and being smart about it all. Can Can I um, comment something about that question? Is since it's uh, suggesting to think about the first day. And for me, I was thinking that it will be very hard for him to cover everything in, in the first day. So probably what I suggest is identifying the, the key things, the most important things that uh, are the things that uh, could um, affect others. And then uh, get around the managers, get around everybody that uh, is part of those main functions and uh, instead of reading and analyzing the culture uh, i think being exposed uh, will be essential for the first days and after that i think <laughs> learning the culture and going to every single of the business uh, aspect um, will be taken care of as time goes by Yeah, I like those points. Very, very true. Well, I hope whoever is uh, in the ghetto is safe. <laughs> Sorry. So what What should be Jim's action plan for the next 12 months, and where should his priorities be? <clears throat> We've talked about it a little bit, but... I think Lindsay talked about it in the beginning, you know, the, the different areas where you can make things efficient. And you really just have to set up a plan and say, all right, you know, if we have excess inventory, you know, here, or I think one, one spot I was reading about uh, some businesses have like, you know, they have like a spare parts business on the side because they go through so many things. So he just needs to, to kind of have, have that plan out and then chunk up the plan in, into little pieces. And, and work with each department head and say, all right, by this time, this is what I want to see here. You know, they, uh, business consultants call them KPIs, key performance indicators. And so mm -hmm. if you're looking at these ratios, you know, you need to have your goals of like, okay, this, you know, our cost, you know, currently is at, I don't know, 50%, but we need to bring that down under the industry standard of 39%. So by the end of 12 months, that's where we want to be. But you know, in three months, we want to come down three percentage points. In six months, we want to come down to, you know, six percentage points or, or whatever the numbers, you know, come out to be. I can't sit here and say exactly what that needs to be. But, um, you know, I don't think you could have these just big goals and say in one year, we're going to be here. It needs to, you need to have, maybe it's monthly <clears throat> milestones. Maybe it's quarterly. I don't know, but you have to have a. So he needs the milestones. Yeah. To get where they need to be. So that they have larger goals, but they're broken down and narrowed. Yeah. Yeah, I I like all that. I mean, I ditto. <laughs> Sounds like a really good plan. I think he also needs to be smart about the customer relations and the um because it says that they have a reputation of not getting things out on time or orders. I don't know if the orders were wrong ever, but. You know, I think you need to definitely fix that so you can keep sales, you know, coming in and product moving out and everything like that. Is is every goal that they make 
um, let's say large term goal, should each of them need to be broken down, or would there be maybe some goal here and there that you know long term goal or large term goal that it's, you couldn't break down that would be beneficial still? Um, you might have to repeat that question for just for my benefit. So we we talked about how you know breaking down all the large term or long term goals. Is there ever going to be a goal that is long term or, or on a large scale that wouldn't need to be broken down? I don't know. I just maybe 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 there are some goals that that are more short term that need to change right away. You know, maybe and I I don't know. The the thing about these case studies is. They don't always just give you a ton of information, right? So, you know, well, what things could he fix in there? You know, it doesn't give us, you know, so, like numbers on every little thing where they're paying a ton and, and overtime because of the messed up orders or they're taking too long to get stuff out or, you know, whatever, whatever. But, you know, if let's just say that they're working all this overtime, plus they're not getting stuff out, well, there's something wrong with the process. And so that would be you know, a short-term goal that you just need to fix right away and not have to and not have to do it in a year. You know, some, some goals are, are that important that you just got to fix right away. So over time, I think, is, would be one of them. But again, I, I don't know what all the problems are because it doesn't always tell us what yeah. all the problems are. And another thing is, whenever we are gonna make a decision, it's weird. It's 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 funny because uh, most of the times they see there, if you go A, it means that you will it will be beneficial for you in the long run. But if you go with with B, it will be beneficial in the short run. Uh, so it, I've seen a bunch of like cases where you either decide what's more beneficial to go for the long run or the or the short run. But uh, why not attacking both and uh, making sure you you cover in the the efficiency or the of the if there is a problem on the stocking out or having too much inventory? Like I think you have to be clever enough to focus on on both terms. Well, um, on page eight, this I just kind of thought. I was been, I've been looking for this. I remember reading it. Um, so the old owner didn't want Jim to talk to any of the employees. Like he could go through the factory, he could look at stuff, he could look at financials, but it was just a big shock to everyone when when the guy was like, "And here's Jim. He's the owner. Goodbye," and left. And they were like, "Uh." uh the other thing he said was, uh, "Oh, and by the way, we have the Teamsters Union here." And you probably should get rid of them. In fact, if you buy the business, you should lock them out. So, I mean, if he felt like that was the right thing, that's an example of a goal that he needs to change like right away. But you make too much change and you just kick a bunch of people out, your business could crumble. And the other thing is he didn't, not only did, he, did the previous owner not want him to talk to current um, employees, he didn't want him to talk to any of the customers either and so you know there's that's risk there so yeah that, that is yeah. a big risk that is a big risk it's it'd be smart for him to talk with everyone and then sit down and make a plan to see what changes he should do first you know so it's not like you were saying you don't do this huge change and things crumble around him but there's enough change to help things start moving forward or moving in a direction where you can start moving forward. Yeah, what well, I had a, a classmate in another uh, class where his mom or his parents bought a business and it was the same type of thing. The guy's like, you can't talk to anyone. He announced it. The guy, the old owner was gone. And then it was just like, it was kind of an awkward transition. I mean, totally. They eventually got there, but, but I mean, I see how the owner, you know, if, if his employees or the, the customers knew that he was selling, you know, maybe that would, maybe he'd lose business in the process and then he couldn't sell his business for as much. So, I mean, I guess I get it both ways. I don't know what the 
what the perfect answer is in that case, but just something interesting to think about. Sorry, I digress. I thought that was inter uh, important to talk about, though, real quick. So, um, so, so with that, did Jim make the right acquisition, or, or did he not? And if so, why or why not? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Yeah, I think I think he made the right acquisition. I mean, who am I to say? You know, he he's, he has a, a lot more of the information than I do from reading this case study. Um, yeah. But you know, he narrowed it down from three hundred to sixty to to this guy. You know, is it was everything perfect the way he wanted to do it? I mean, he was he was ready to walk away when they were about two hundred fifty thousand dollars apart from you know what the selling price. You know, I yeah, that's true. one was so they wanted two million, and he was like, um, "How about uh, one point seven five?" You know, so and they, he found a way to make it work. Um, you know, are there challenges or struggles that that are ahead? Yeah, absolutely. But I think I think he bought a business, and obviously, any business that you know, I, I guess I don't want to say. Like I work in the long-term care industry, so like skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes, and that kind of stuff. And so whenever one of those buildings is bought, you know, there's a reason that it was being sold because you know it had there's issues there, and so the new owner sees opportunity in, in bringing on you know a better management team or a better um, more efficiency and you know changing the reputation and all that stuff. So. I mean, if he was buying a business that had no problems, uh, he wouldn't be able to afford it. Yeah, yeah. Either he wouldn't be able to afford it, or you can't find any businesses that are just humming along, going, doing great that people want to sell because they're like, "Well, yeah. my business is going great. I'm making a bunch of money, and we're growing. Why would I sell it?" So, anyway, I guess there's always going to be problems, but he felt that he had the requisite background and experience to really turn things around and make it just a, a huge success. So I think he made the right decision. Yeah, I agree with that. I think he made the right decision for sure. I mean, I think um, if you remember, I think the old owner even called him and was frustrated and like wanted to talk to him because after years, I think it says after months of pro uh, low profitability, or whatever he was just fed up with his own company you know so he was ready to get out as well and if the owner is you know not passionate about the company it's not going to be successful because you're not going to be able to make the smart movements or put in the work required or motivate your employees or or whatever else so i think it was a smart move on his part to buy this company yeah um something that jorge said was that um he was passionate about this venture too um and, and the acquisition which i i'm gonna agree with as well is a huge key factor um i mean i don't think he would have bought it if he wasn't passionate or didn't like what he saw um he saw room for improvement and i think that's what made it a good acquisition yeah definitely Is Hector still here? Yeah, yeah. So for for that, my intake will be pretty much the same. I've been like, for example, in jobs where I don't I don't enjoy what to what I am doing, and now that I'm trying to create my my own business and work in that in that kind of uh, way, uh, I cannot imagine myself uh, starting something new where I don't have passion about it and. If 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 I were to acquire a business, definitely has to be something I like and I enjoy doing. Definitely. So Jake, do you, are we like having to type this stuff down and then turn in this, or we just turn in the link to the to our discussion, right? Um, I think we yeah. I think we have to do a summary, right? We don't. Have no. 
kind of what we're doing is summarizing the whole thing. Um, and he doesn't okay. watch these, I don't think. So. Okay. Well, I heard someone typing, so I didn't know if someone was like kind of taking notes <laughs> over this. I'm like, hey, I, I want to get a copy of that too. No, we just, we just. Okay. Um, I'll send you guys the link. So let me stop this broadcast.